Hello and welcome to another edition of Gaming on the Fringe. Faster than light travel has long been a staple of science fiction for good reason. Even at the staggering fast speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, space is so huge it's best measured in light years, or how far light travels in a year, something like 6 trillion miles. Of course, when all the interesting places would take decades if not centuries to reach, it gets kind of boring. Unfortunately, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity showed that nothing can go faster than light, or does it? Now, we've already discussed wormholes, which sidestep the speed limit by simply cutting the hole through space-time to drastically shorten the travel time, but there's another famous way we might get around the barrier, warp drive. Long a staple of sci-fi, Star Trek anyone? Warp drive has become the subject of legitimate scientific research the last few years. Before we get into the why, let's look at some gaming examples of the classic warp drive. Now, No Man's Sky may be divisive as hell, but I have loved it from day one. I wanted an exploration-based space opera, and I got it. The main mode to go FTL in-game, and for a long part of the game, the only way, is with hyperdrive. Now, usually in science fiction, a hyperdrive implies a usage of something like hyperspace, an alternate dimension that lets you go faster than light. But in this case, it's actually a warp drive. The fuel to power your hyperdrive is even called a warp cell, which is a one-time use item containing antimatter and negative matter. Remember that for later on. The hyperdrive has a limited range, and this determines what star system you can travel to at any time. The view from a hyperdrive jump actually seems to compress space in front of your ship, which is also something we'll come back to. The other one that I really want to cover is Mass Effect Andromeda, another game I've actually enjoyed that a lot of people did not. The Andromeda species of the Ket don't have access to the giant Mass Effect relays that allow galactic scale travel like the Milky Way species would have, so they have to come up with something different. The Ket use their Mass Effect technology in a way that no Milky Way species ever did. They use it to create an Alcubierre warp drive. This allows them speeds that Milky Way species just cannot touch, even if it is slower than a Mass Effect relay travel would be. In the first trilogy, though, the Normandy does come very close to this, as its handless drive creates an area of compressed space ahead of the ship that it falls into, but it's just used for normal travel. It's not an Alcubierre drive. Now you may be asking, what the hell is an Alcubierre drive and why is it called that? And so we're going to go back to 1994. That summer, Miguel Alcubierre was relaxing on vacation watching a favorite show of his, Star Trek. He started wondering if the iconic warp drive had any chance of working in real life, as a lot of fans definitely have. The difference here is that Alcubierre was actually a physicist who specialized in solutions for general relativity. So he sat down and came up with a semi-serious proposal he wrote on a paper called The Warp Drive, Hyperfast Travel Within General Relativity. The thing is, Alcubierre started his math a bit different than others. He began with a region of space that was moving faster than light and worked his math backwards. He discovered that if you compress space-time in front of an object while expanding it behind you, you can create a warp bubble, which is the term he uses for this, that allows for effective faster than light travel. While relativity says that no object can travel faster than light, space itself is not held to this rule, so the Alcubierre draft creates a pocket of space-time that travels faster than light while the ship rides inside of it. Amusingly, it's been said that nothing can travel faster than light, so Alcubierre found a way to make nothing carry something. Inside the bubble, the ship is actually at rest, and you would experience freefall because you're not actually moving, even while the bubble itself is going FTL. Thus, you sidestep the universal speed limit by letting part of the universe do the work. By engineering the metric of space-time itself, you have this handy FTL drive, which is why you often hear it called the Alcubierre metric. Now, compressing space-time is the simpler part. Strong lasers directed into a single target or even pushing a small mass at very high speed. Even my old school chemical rockets could do so. But expanding space-time is a harder task. It requires negative mass. Now, I've covered this in previous installments, so I won't go too deep into it, but the problem here is the sheer amount needed. Alcubierre's original paper made the claim that it would take more mass energy than the entire universe but of course, later revisions have shown that this is not true. Dr. Harold Sonny White of NASA did some refiguring by changing the bubble to a torus, a donut for Homer Simpson fans, which took the amount of negative mass down to about 700 kilograms or less, which could be lowered even more if the torus was oscillated, turned on and off over time. He is also currently running experiments in NASA to make a tiny warp field. Dr. Chris Vandenbroek showed that if you expand the inside of the bubble, contracting the outside, you could drop the mass down considerably, and Sergei Krasnikov showed it to be just milligrams. Remember that last guy, he's in another video. Now I know it's the first thing you're going to wonder, how fast can this thing go? The short answer is, we don't really know. Dr. Alcubierre discussed at the speeds of terms of 10c, 10 times faster than light, 
apparently assumed that the ship was at rest before activating the drive. I think we can then assume that a moving ship that activates its alcubarrelly drive would go much faster, and that's what Dr. Sonny White claimed. He wrote a very interesting paper called Warpville Mechanics 101 that I'll link down below, and he discusses the speed in terms of multipliers. Since technically an alcubarrelly drive bubble doesn't move on its own, it acts as a multiplier for a ship's intrinsic speed. We're going to throw some quick math out here. Say the multiplier is 1,000, and your ship is moving at 0.5c when you activate the drive. Suddenly you're cruising around at 500c, you're just about a light year and a half travel per standard Earth day. Very fast, but much slower than nearly any sci-fi drive. Now, even at 10c, we can get to our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, in about half a day, which is much better than the current thousands of years it would take us with current real-world tech. This amusingly follows many video game FTL tropes that simply multiply the real-world speed when FTL is activated. Now we're going to come to the drawbacks. I'm going to ignore the generation of exotic matter, just how to construct the Alcubierre drive as it stands, because those are much more in-depth than this video can ever go. The question I'm covering here is what a pilot of a warp ship would have to consider. First of all, there's the evidence that a superluminal bubble would accumulate high levels of Hawking radiation at the borders of the bubble that could fry everything inside. And that's not a good thing. Not only that, but it may be that you couldn't control an FPL bubble, so it's turn on, hope you're aimed to where you want to go, and hope for the best. Interestingly, this follows the softest of mainstream science fiction, Star Wars, where hyperdrive is aimed at a planet and then is only taken out of hyperspace by a deep gravity well. Now, to be fair, using an alcubierre drive below light speed takes away these two problems and gives you the classic sci-fi trope of a reactionless drive. Interestingly, some interpretations of drive make it almost like an interstellar rare world with set up stations that would configure the shape of the warp to give you the full superluminal travel. Of course, these would have to be set up at slower than light speeds, which is also how a wormhole network would most likely be have to set up. Now, the worst downside is we have no idea what happens to anything that a warp ship runs into during its travels. Interstellar space seems like it's empty, but there's loads of micrometeors, atoms of hydrogen and the like floating around. Now, imagine all those swept up by that compressed space-time warp ship, and then the ship drops warp. Does all that matter blast out like the most dangerous shotgun in the galaxy? Does it just get shunted off? We just don't know. Now, while the small-scale experiments are being done by Dr. White at NASA's Advanced Propulsion Team, where he essentially acts as NASA's mad scientist, it may well turn out that the Alcubierre Drive is an interesting mathematical theory, but not physically possible. It could be a case of us hope, grasping at straws and hoping for something, or it very well could turn out later on that science marches on and we figure out how it works. As always, if you have anything to comment, please do so below or catch me on Twitter at I think I broke it. And as always, thanks for watching.